asked uh, some of the regulars, like myself, to um, see if we couldn't find somebody really interesting to introduce to the community. Um, so right about the time he said that, I got really lucky because I met uh, Chitra Alango. Say hi, everybody. Hey, everyone. Hey. You're, you're going to get to see how awesome she is because I'm only going to speak for about three minutes, and then I'm going to turn the mic over to her. And, but I want to um, tell you, well, first I have to do my obligatory these are some of the books I've written, the DevOps Handbook. We actually have a couple of copies back there signed. We, we didn't bring enough for everybody, sorry. Um, and then one other thing I, I'm really proud of, about two months ago, um, Gene Kim and I finished an audio project called Beyond the Phoenix Project. So it's out on Audible. It's, 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 it was just a lot of fun. Um, I'm, you know, Derek covered a lot of the scare you to death slides. <laughs> so I can give up a lot of my slides here on this. Um, I think, you know, so I'm, I'm going to, you know, this was from last year's software supply chain report. I mean, like, it, like that software supply chain report is really, really good data, right? So, like, you should get it. Um, you know, the numbers are astounding. Um, he went through, so I'm going through fast because, again, like, I'm not going to repeat a lot of, he, I mean, he did a way better job than I would on the data. Um, but I did want to a little bit talk about the anatomy of that struts too a little bit. And Derek had that you know, had that slide and showed like when it hit and all that. But I wanted to tell this as um, a, a true not story. So I've been doing DevOps, you know, for, um, you know, since the beginning, you know, I, in fact, you know, I'm one of the original kind of core organizers of the DevOps movement per se. And, um, and one of the things that made me fall in love with DevSecOps is this idea that, you know, in, in DevOps, we think about the systems approach, how do things look from a systems, complex systems, and, and what I started seeing is um, organizations like Shannon uh, and Intuit, like just the way they thought about how they did, um, did security with kind of the way you deliver software. A lot of what Derek talked about. So just, um, you know, just not to, you know, pound on Equifax. I have some friends there. But like, you know, if you think about like, um, you know, the announcement on the 9th um, and then, you know, somewhere in July they, they started discovering it. Um, I went, I got the opportunity to meet Shitra um, early this year, I think, and we talked about it, and what, what was amazing, and this is the thing, right? Like all the, the, the software, all the things that you do, um, it all ties back to why are you in business? Um, the most successful company in the last probably 100 years um, from just crushing the competition is Toyota. And I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on Toyota and all, but like for about 50 years, they destroyed the competition. I mean, it destroyed, um, like Godzilla. Um, and the thing is, they had a true north, right? It was single police flow, and like everybody understood that. And I think that like you can't do security if you can't tie the security to your true north. So, um, so if you look at the Fannie Mae webpage, so I'm, I'm literal, a little bit of literary license, but not too far off. The first thing you're going to see is where the people that put people in houses. So if you think about like, uh, and I've talked to Shitra about this, like they get they find out on the ninth that um, that there's the stretch to vulnerability. They you know they Shitra sits down and get they get a war room going and they know that if their front web page is going to splash that where the people put you in houses, you know trust us, that this vulnerability was something that could not be ignored. And so she put a war room together with the team and went ahead and actually within a couple of days basically mitigated th this vulnerability. I mean, um, she can tell you more, but like she basically wrote a script and paralyzed it. They hit every URI and URL in the company. And, and the most amazing part of this story is she got the executive team or the team together to, to agree to shut down the production loan application. Right? And, um, and so... Like, what is your true north? I mean, it, it, when it's go time, do you actually show up? And do the executives say, oh my goodness, and, but yes. Um, you know, so, I, and again, Derek went through a lot of these things, and then he talked about the spring problem, right, which is, it's all over again. And you would think after the, what happened with the Wall Street Journal and CNN, all talking about Equifax, like, it's all a problem. No, right, like, it, it's, it's still out there. Um, and so the, the last thing I wanted to say is that I think that when we look at security, we've got this institutional memory muscle. One, that we think that 
if we protect the perimeter, life will be good. Uh, Martin Casado, the founder of Nasir, basically the person who defines software defined networking, used to say, we've got it wrong. We spent 80% on perimeter based and 20% on, on inner perimeter, right? And, um, you know, and so that's one, I think we've got it wrong, right? The traffic patterns have changed significantly. It's an east, it's an east west world. It's not a north south world anymore. So then, where is the Goldilocks zone for cybersecurity? Is it like some black box that's, that costs you, you know, 10 million a year? Or is it in the software delivery pipeline, right? So that's the new Goldilocks zone. And the one thing also I want to say is that, um, you know, God bless vendors and sponsors, but and this is one thing that should, should tell me is that, like, you have to bend security to your will. So maybe a proprietary product here or open source product here or something you write your own, but you have to own this thing. And the problem that places like Equifax and other people get into is they think they can buy one or two vendors, pay 15 or 20 million a year, and then be safe and, hey, I'm covered. You know, I've got this box, I've got this. And, and you li literally have to like own it daily, hourly, and make you know, the products and the structure of the delivery bend to your will. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to Chitra now and she's gonna tell you an amazing story that I fell in love with when I first met and saw how she was doing uh, uh, security. Thank you, John, thank you. Yeah, the pressure is on because somebody said we are going to have a great presentation. Hope I do justice to the presentation. But I did it well. I didn't trip. Usually I trip. <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> so that's a good sign. Um, I enjoy, I'm Chitra Ilango from Fannie Mae. Thank you all for being here this morning. Uh, I enjoyed the journey of DevSecOps at Fannie Mae. I'm hoping you will also enjoy. And the journey has not ended. It'll never end. It's an ongoing journey. Like every organization in the industry, Fannie Mae had challenges. Well, the challenges, we always, information security has a habit of blaming the developers, not writing secure code. Developers looking at information security as uh, the demon in the closet, right? So we had to change all of those. So what were the challenges? So application security was done after the fact, meaning after the development, after the testing was done, information security got in. And they started doing the test. And they said, OK, here you go, and throw the report of the vulnerabilities over the fence. Do you think it was the right thing to do? I don't think so, because at that point of time, it was too late in the game. Because you don't have time or budget, you cannot stop the application from being deployed to production. right? So what did the developers do? They said, oh, we have a way around. Let's accept risk. The risk was sitting there for a long time. And we started collecting debt in terms of risk acceptance. Guess what? Who owned the risk? Information security. I have no idea why information security owned the risk when the developers were developing the code. And it's not fair to always blame the developers. Information security, at least from my perspective, I'm from application security, we were running very slow. We were very slow in catching up. Developers were moving with Agile, Sprint. We didn't have the resource or the bandwidth. If you had several applications going into production at a time, with six to eight people, how many applications can, can you test and do a right due diligence in testing it? It was impossible, or next to impossible. And then what happened was, I think, oh, I'm so sorry, I skipped the agenda and I went directly to, uh, so the challenges we had with information security, I was just talking. And then with the development services, oh boy, being a developer was a nightmare. If you came and asked me two years ago, do you want to be a developer? I come from a development background. I would say no, because life was difficult. You had several checkpoints. Everybody wanted a piece of the pie. The functionality could be just one plus one, click of a button, give me the result as two. But to get this to production, it would take six months in the waterfall method, right? So we had to think, these were the challenges. We had to come up with a way, we had to step back, 
Information security had to think like a developer. Developer needs to think like a security person. We have to be one. Security is everybody's problem. So what did we do when we had the challenges? We had to make promises. Well, keeping up the promise is a different story, but we had to make promises. What did we do? From the information security, we said, how do we change the organization to better suit to be able to deploy secure code into production? And we came up with strategies like developer empowerment. That's my favorite part. Empower the developers and then enlighten the business, involve the business, make them responsible, accountable, right? Because it's their application that's been deployed. They are the developers who are developing the code. So give them metrics. Business usually, you know, application team might understand the risk, the impact, likelihood of something that's bad out there. But as a business, you need to enlighten them. You need to talk to them about these are your vulnerabilities, these are the risks. If somebody tried to or got into your system through this vulnerability, what is the risk to the organization? Believe me, it gets their attention because nobody wants to be in the headlines. Right? So we did make all of these promises. Thank you. From the development services, we had this waterfall method and one, nine to 18 months was the time to develop and deliver a product. It was way too much. So we started moving towards the agile. We didn't want people to have the project plans and it was too much. So we needed to have self-governing teams who could deliver products on a timely basis or once in two months or once in two weeks sprints. And we also had to talk about automation because automation is, if you knew you had to keep a cup of water from the jar onto the table every day in terms of technology, I, I don't know if that's the right analogy, but in my case, I would automate it. I would have something to do that job on a daily basis and I would spend my time doing something innovative. So these were the challenges, these were the promises we made. From, I'm going to talk more from the information security perspective because keeping the time, I know they gave me 10 more extra minutes, but I'll talk more in depth about the information security side of it. We developed or built a program on these three pillars. I, I, we shouldn't take the credit. I think the credit goes partially to the DevSec, DevOps, handbook uh, with Jean Kim and John Willis were co-authored and few other authors were there. So we were, my director and I were reading it and we said, we have to plan, we have all of these great things, but we need to come up with pillars so that we can put them in each bucket. So the first one is integrate with culture. Oh boy, that was the toughest one. Automating, making it easy was all the easy part, but integrating with the culture. Because when I walked into a room and I said, I was a developer, people respected me and were nice to me as a developer. But when I said, I'm from information security, they moved away from me, <laughs> believe me. They, I don't know for some reason, but we all need to, you know, if you had asked me about information security two and a half years ago, I would have said the same thing. I said, ugh. Information security just runs tools and spits out and sends a report. They have nothing else to do. They have no idea how to do a job. And the developers need to understand that's not true. Now I, my thought process differs because I'm part of information security. They just don't run tools. You need technical skills. Reports, I mean, tools can only do so much, right? It cannot do everything. There's that human touch that is needed. You think all of these Apache struts, you know, John was talking about Apache struts. Jakarta, that was the Equifax one. Well, there are 68 vulnerabilities against struts. Guess what? They have been there from 2010. And all of a sudden, it became a zero day vulnerability. Why? Because somebody decided, I have free time, I'm going to be bad to the world today, let me exploit. So things could happen. And I don't know if you're aware, there are 12 other vulnerabilities which can be causing the same impact or exploitation risk with something called OGNL, right? 
If you take a look at that, it does the same thing. But why are we giving importance to Jakarta? Because somebody else exploited it. But we need to step back. Tools can only do so much. No offense to tools. Tools will do a great job. But also, the hackers are not going to use the tools and try to hack. Right? They're going to think out of the box. Because they know big companies have these great tools. They have the rule sets. Everything is going to run. But they're going to think out of the tool set thought process and try to attack you. So what I'm trying to allude here is you need to be capable of thinking like hackers from the information security. So you, to do that, you need to write scripts. It could be Groovy, it could be Python, it could be anything, any kind of scripts or any kind of technology. But you need to write something. So who is writing that? The developer. So who can best be security folks? other than the developers from application security. That's my thought, you know. Train the developers. They do a great job with coding, but when it comes to functionality or security, what do you think they're going to choose? As a developer, seriously, I don't know if I have to say this, I don't care about security. I was only worried about functionality because the business is paying me money to get them something beautiful to see on the screen or the functionality. They didn't care if it was secure or not secure. So train the developers. People talk about you know, integrating tools at the different sets of the CI, CD, DevSecOps. All of the things are the same to me. DevSecOps or CI, CD pipeline, everything is the same thing. Talk to them and train them. Tools, yes, it can find. But start developing or training the developers to write secure code. What did we do in Fannie Mae? We empowered the developers by training them. How did we train them? We started having top 10 OWASP. Yay, top 10 OWASP is great, but the hackers are not just looking at the top 10 OWASP, right? They're thinking beyond that. So what you need to do is train them. We had experts from industries come every month, once a month, train them and personally I don't like the PowerPoint presentations where somebody is talking like I'm doing now, you know, it doses, you, they put you to sleep. But this is more interactive where the person who's presenting will talk about what the exploitation, what the vulnerability means. They would show the vulnerability being exploited real time and you go fix it and then retest it. This is how our, I mean, our trainings worked. It's all recorded and on our FAQ page. So if the developer or developers missed it during the brown bag, no worries. They can always go and check back on the FAQ page to rewatch it. Then we also believed in having sample, secure sample code and Java and .NET. We started writing the top 10 OS. We usually start with that and add. So we, at, at this point, I think we have around 40 sample code where the, it is open to anybody in Fannie Mae as read-only. It's an ongoing uh, process where we keep adding sample codes. And it's as easy as saying, comments, add your code here. So people could copy that and start making changes. So that way, we not only spoke about write secure code, we showed them how to write secure code. Right. The next one is my favorite. In the past, when I was a developer, I would ask a information security or application security tester, can you tell me what this vulnerability is? Can you help me fix it? Oh, that is a vulnerability, go fix it. So I wondered if the tester knew how to code and how to help me. Believe me, they do, but I think they don't have the time to sit with the developers to help them. So we changed that process. What did we do? We, alongside the developers, we help them write secure code within their application. That is so great. I didn't have that support. It took me probably 10 hours to do the research and correct a SQL injection, which is the simplest of things to do the right way. But if you had a tester, application security tester, tell you how to write it, it just took me 30 minutes. You just had to talk to me about input validations, parameterized queries, and things like that. And I would understand, because you were talking my lingo as a developer. Make security, the next pillar is make security easy. Wow. 
we all go to conferences, come with 10 different new tools. We'll say, oh, the old tools are not working. Let's integrate all the new tools. No, that's going to make life difficult, not only for the information security folks, but the developers the most. So what do you do? Use the existing pipeline tools, which the developers are already used to and are using currently. Integrate your security into those pipeline or in that pipeline. So that way the developers are not having to learn 100 different tools, new tools from what they are used to. What we did with Fannie Mae was we started using Jira for defect tracking. We used Jenkins for pipeline. And also as a developer with the agile model, all of us you know, are not in the same project for one year. We keep changing every two weeks or every two months. Right? So what happens in such cases is, when a developer A is developing at this point of time and leaves to go work on a different project, a new developer takes over the job, he or she is looking, where are the artifacts? Where is my previous report? No worries, we have automated, we have integrated, we have merged. So usually the developers can rerun the scan, baseline it, and start from there. It's all there in the repository for us. And then what did we do? Automate everything. Developers do not have the time to spend on downloading hundreds of things and manually uploading, manually downloading, merging. No, they don't have the time. I know I talk like a developer most of the time, I do. They don't have the time, so automate everything Wherever possible, I'm not saying you can automate everything in the pipeline, you need to automate wherever things are feasible to make it seamless for the developers to actually use your pipeline. I have to say I borrowed this from Gartner's from online. I like the infinity loop. If you see security is everywhere. Security is not in the development, not in the operations, it's everywhere. Make it everybody's problem. Security is a byproduct of culture. That's my favorite line. Change the culture, everything will be a success. If, you, you know, if a developer thinks, I don't care about security, there won't be success within the DevSecOps. We did speak about the three pillars. This is a visual thing. And this is our ar reference architecture. I know it looks very plain and simple. When I look at some of the images outside online, they look so colorful with everything. And I said, oh my god, this looks so, I shouldn't use the word cheap, but this works for us. And when I present this to a developer or an executive or an information security person, they know, oh, this is a CI, this is a development, this is the CD. Everybody can relate to this. I can you know, have some human being images, which I might probably after I leave from here. Uh, but this is our reference architecture. Believe me, this reference architecture came in one hour. This happened when I had a conversation with one of the developers. It was a very rude conversation. I usually don't lose my temper, but that point of time, it was six o'clock in the evening, I lost my temper. And I said, I'm asking you to do something to be secure and you're fighting me. And do you want Fannie Mae to be in the headlines? And I came back and I said, you know what? Step back. Put yourself in that person's shoes. Think how you would have reacted. Guess what? I would have reacted worse than that person did. So that is when I said, we need to change something. This is not working. So that is when we came with something called DevSecOps. Probably we didn't know it was out there in the market being used the way it was, but we just said we'll introduce security. I like the word sec DevOps, but then it didn't have a good ring to it. So we said, okay, we'll go with DevSecOps. And if you see in the development, where do you start? The developer starts developing code at the IDE, be it Eclipse or you know, Visual Studio. You have to make life easy for a developer and integrate a simple, lightweight tool. I don't want to have a heavy tool waiting there after I save, wait for an hour to get my results. No, I need something real quick. Two seconds, I need the results. So integrate a security tool within the IDE or 
Even better would be, that's what I would like to do. Integrate whenever you request Eclipse for an IDE, package the third party security tool as part of IDE. That's the way it should be done. But in Fanime, we have a third party where you have to put in request and actually go and add it as a third party within your IDE. It's as simple as when you click the save or press the save to save your page, it'll tell you these are your issues, go and fix it. It's like a yellow light or even an orange light. I don't know, I've never seen an orange light, but yellow light which says stop, look at these, fix, right? The next stage is we went to the build. We had a lightweight tool called Fire. I, again, I have to put this disclaimer out. I'm not here to promote a tool or tools. This is the story of Fannie Mae, and I'm talking about what are the tools that worked in Fannie Mae. So don't take me wrong saying that, you know, I'm choosing one tool over the other. No, it's just what we do at Fannie Mae. So we used open source called Find Security Bugs at the build time, which was a lightweight tool. And as soon as you build, the developers didn't even know it was running behind the scenes because it was automated. And the next one is we had the Fortify for static code analysis, SAST. All of these tools I'm talking about is a SAST. It's code at rest, right, in your repository. So what we did was we started using HP Fortify. We integrated HP Fortify. HP Fortify is a heavyweight tool. It takes time to run depending on how big your application is. Right, so I recommend personally run it on a nightly basis. And then what we did was, we were nice to people, we started giving them warnings as quality gates. We said, you have issues here, go ahead and fix. But then some of us follow rules, some of us don't. So then we introduced the governance body saying that you need to fix this. And we started breaking the build. And guess what, one, one day I had a developer ask me, why is your tool always breaking and not building it successfully? I said, let's go and check. And it says your build broke because of these new vulnerabilities. I said, it's by design. Go and fix your vulnerabilities and run it. It'll build, right? So we broke the build. And then we started tracking them as Jira defects. Don't separate the security bugs from the defect of your functionalities. Have it in one place so that it becomes your story for your next print. So it's visible, everybody can see it, right? And then what we did was, with the headlines, everything was alluding to third party. The common trend was third party vulnerabilities. Struts, Jakarta, OGNL, Stomp, the Spring, everything was third party vulnerabilities. So what did we do? We said we need to integrate third party vulnerabilities as part of our pipeline. So what we did was we promised them end of this year, guess what? We said because of the headlines, we have to make it a priority. We integrated the sonar type, Nexus sonar type, within our Fortify scan, and we broke the build and tracked defects. And all of these, we didn't have developers go to 10 different places to see the reports of the vulnerabilities. We had one spot. We used Sonar Cube to have a beautiful dashboard. People like me you know, can't read XML value, you know, attribute name value pair. So we gave them pretty things saying, these are existing vulnerabilities, these are new vulnerabilities. Everything is in one spot. And then we had a link to go to the third party vulnerabilities to the IQ server to get their vulnerabilities for their applications. And all of the green ones are where security plays a part. Oh, I'm so happy people are taking pictures of this simple reference architecture. Uh, and if you see there's a yellow part, that, is, that means we are in the POCs well. This is the first forum I'm going to say we have completed that. So we gave the developers the static code analysis or empowered them to run their own scans. Guess what, SAS can only do so much. We needed also DAST, the dynamic application security testing. It's out there and we have four applications onboarded as of Friday. And my, even my executives doesn't, they don't know this, I'm just announcing it here. So that's a big, big accomplishment. And many people I think have noticed in the industry did the dash, it's very difficult to do, they give up. So what I would suggest is a piece of advice, my opinion, do the SAST, it's a little easier. Then once you have everything, 
then go to dust. Okay, I just have five more minutes. I know I love talking. Uh, so we had the challenges, we had the promises. Well, did we deliver? That's the most important because executives are looking for delivery, right? Yes, we did deliver. The proof is right here. We reduced the number of remediation risk acceptance. People are putting in remediation plans, which they are saying that we'll fix them. And then the number of third party vulnerabilities which had critical findings have reduced with the you know, people downloading them have reduced. And then we also have, um, well, I think the proof, I, I'm very bad with numbers. So the proof is here, yes, we did promise and we delivered. The next one is, all of this could not have happened without the support of developers, great, information security, but where's the money coming from, right? We need to prove to the executives that this worked. So we did have DevSecOps days in Fannie Mae. We had around 200 people show up from outside of Fannie Mae, and we had several people on the WebEx. It was a super duper hit, and you know everybody liked it. And I think the slide is missing is we also won an award um, this year for being the innovative uh, project of introducing security within DevSecOps. Uh, it was called the CSO 50, and Fannie Mae was one of the companies which won the award. I had to tell that show off, right? Yep. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and then, you know, lessons learned. I would like to say, oh, we didn't learn lessons because we learned from other people's mistakes. Well, in reality, that's not true. We did learn our lessons. The culture change was the number one. Change the culture. Everybody needs to act as one team rather than working in silos. Treat vulnerable, security vulnerabilities as defects, not anything different from a functional defect, right? When you're moving towards the left, use the tool set that's already there. Don't introduce hundreds of new tool set and waste time. Because we did get those tools for a reason. We must have done our research before even we got them. So why waste it? And then next one is, I think, single score. I don't see that. Single score is very misleading, meaning that we have different tools giving their own scores. One is the architecture transactional score. One is the security. Have several scores. So that way it talks about security and the other scoring. So you know where you stand. Coming soon, DAST, which we already, I know we, pro, we uh, deliver quicker than we promised. We gave the DAST, we gave the third party vulnerability breaking for the SONA type, and container is, we are at the infancy state, but probably next year we'll be talking about the mature state of container. I know it's, we all hope for good things, right? So hopefully we do something with the containers. And any questions, I know I'm running late, uh, any questions? I'll be out here. Anything technical questions, how we integrated, how we did things. And this is, again, just the DevSecOps to the left. We have something to the right, which is even more amazing than the left. So please feel free to you know, come by and talk to me. And I, can, I took a lot from this community in 2016 because I would go to conferences and presentation and ask questions. And now I'm here giving back to the community. So please feel free to you know, reach out. Any questions? I can take one. No? Oh, wow, I did a great job. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.